Have you wondered why people of African descent are found in various regions of the world today? In Latin America, the United States of America, the Caribbean, Indian Ocean Islands, the Middle East, and even India? Apart from the voluntary human migration who went out of Africa, continent of origins 100,000 years ago to populate the rest of the globe, the answer takes us back to a painful period whose consequences are still being weighed on the image many have of Africans and their descendants in the world. Slavery is a universal institution. In other words, it has existed in a variety of forms, in many cultures and many societies. In fact, the word is derived from Slav. People of Eastern Europe frequently raided and sold into slavery during the Middle Ages. However, when people speak of slavery in this day and age, most think of sub-Saharan Africans and of the descendants of African slaves in the various regions of the world. We shall try, focusing mainly on transatlantic slave trade, to reconstitute a history of the slave trade and slavery, drawing on the experience and rationale of period characters. These are not real characters, but they are based on accounts by men and women who had first-hand experience of this history. Mr. Brooks is a major slave trader from Liverpool. He is going to tell us why he became involved in buying and selling human beings. Thanks to the efforts of the Portuguese and Spanish, sugarcane was acclimatized to the New World's latitudes, so we could now start envisaging large single-crop sugar plantations for mass production. The great European families were passionate about sugar, but the high price prevented those on lower incomes to buy it. So we had to reduce production costs as much as possible. In the New World, we had the right land and climate for the mass production of sugar cane, but it was a crop that required a large labor force. The Amerindians had been almost entirely decimated by diseases brought by the first European settlers and the great cruelty of the conquistadors. The few survivors were, in theory, protected by the church. The settlers could not therefore exploit them in the most profitable way for their trade. Those distant lands that many imagined to be full of cannibals scared many Europeans. And even the most unfortunate among them hesitated to go to the Americas to work as agricultural laborers. So we decided to turn to the dark continent. We'd already had good long-standing trading relations with several African kings and a few important merchants with whom we traded mostly gold, ivory and spices. Gradually, with their permission, we built a handful of forts at strategic points all along the Atlantic coast to protect our traders and merchandise and the crews of our ships. The forts are even more useful for the development of the slave trade. 
From the 16th century, the great European maritime powers of the time, Portugal, England, Spain, the Netherlands, France, and Denmark, started this money-making trade. The ships left European ports laden with firearms, precious fabrics, spirits, and other luxury products. The goods were then exchanged on the African coast for men and women who had been made captives. They were then sold in the New World and forced violently into slavery. Then these boats stocked up in the Caribbean and along the Atlantic coast of North America before returning to Europe, loaded with sugar, coffee, cotton, cocoa, precious metals, etc. Other boats still practiced this trade by connecting Africa to the Americas, Brazil in particular. Merchants, traders, bankers, insurers, and ship owners made vast profits. This same economic model that was used from the early 6th century until the early 20th century was at the heart of the slave trade in the Arab Muslim world. For several centuries, the African continent was to be stripped of its vital forces for the benefit of other societies that built their economic prosperity and development on the violent deportation and forced labor of dozens of millions of sons and daughters of Africa. Musa was waiting impatiently for his initiation. He was at last going to become a man, the greatest Vedic hunter, learning the secrets of the forests and animals. But Musa was never initiated. No one told me anything, but I did think that something was going on. I'd talked about it with Tumani, my best friend. We were almost certainly going to be initiated, at last, become great, fearless warriors. Everyone was busy in the village. The preparations even outdid those for the last harvest festival. Only, my father seemed worried. He'd been told that the manhunters had been spotted near our village. At daybreak, I was woken by a great hullabaloo, panic, shouting, and gunshots everywhere. Our village was under attack. Our warriors and their spears were powerless against those men carrying firearms. Even Siddiqui, the strongest warrior of all, was captured like a wild animal. I was attached to Tumani by a solid forked branch fastened at the neck, and our hands and feet were roped together. A horse had trodden on poor Tumani's foot during the struggle. He was limping. We're exhausted now. We've been walking for several moons. The women and children seem exhausted. Our coffle got longer at each stop as new captives, press ganged by manhunters, joined us. After walking for miles and miles, I saw, in the distance, the outlines of a huge city that seemed to dominate the entire desert. It must have been Jenne. My father had often spoken to me about it. It's a disreputable city, he'd told me. A city where human beings are sold. Two men came into the yard where we were being held. They came into the pen which we were all herded. They pointed me out along with another ten people, but not too many. Musa will be taken across the desert and sold on to an Arab merchant. He will then be castrated to fetch a higher price as a eunuch. But Musa will not survive the operation. In the Arab Muslim world, slaves were traded over desert routes as well as sea routes across the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean, and the Mediterranean Sea. Three sea routes were used by the Europeans trading in slaves. The Indian Ocean route, the Mediterranean Sea, and on a massive scale, the Atlantic Ocean route. Lala is from the Kingdom of Congo. She was captured by manhunters while looking for firewood to cook dinner. She recounts a few moments of the middle passage as if from a logbook. Boarding 
We were let out of the dark, dank cells in which we had been crammed for several weeks. We were taken by dugout to one of the huge ships off the fortress. I had never seen anything like it. More white men were waiting for us there. A white man with a long scar on his face grabbed my arm and shoved me onto the ship. We were all scared. The incessant whipping drew cries and blood. We were then pitched into the ship's gloomy hold, men on one side, women and children on the other. First day of the crossing. Our bodies were pressed up against each other. Our shackles were securely fastened to the ship's hull, so we could hardly move. I could hardly breathe. When the rolling and pitching of the ship made us seasick, we vomited on ourselves or on our neighbours. A stench of commingled vomit, excrement and sweat pervaded the hold. Second day of the crossing. I was brutally dragged out of my chains, along with some other girls. Once on deck, three white men threw buckets of seawater into our faces. Then I was rubbed down with a dirty cloth and pushed into the cabin of a man who seemed to be the leader. The other girls were handed over to the mercy of the crew. Fourth day. The ship stopped moving forward. We rode at anchor for several days and departed again only when some other captives were loaded onto the ship just as we had been. Tenth day. Pemba, the girl shackled on my left, had stopped moving. We understood each other a bit, for although we spoke different languages, they were quite similar. I called to her, but she didn't answer. The white man with the scar untied her and dragged her body away to dump it in the ocean. Owing to the insanitary conditions aboard the ships, Frequent outbreaks of major epidemics made the crossing even more fraught for the African captives. Seventeenth day of the crossing. Sometimes they took us on deck to make us dance under the whip. On that day, they made us line up carefully and forced us to watch a terrible scene. A man who had tried to jump overboard was whipped savagely in front of everyone. His unbearable screams made us pluck up our courage again. That triggered the revolt. They had firearms and swords. We had only our hands and the chains that bound them together. About 60 out of 410 Africans, mostly women and children, perished. We had won, but we didn't know how to steer the huge ship. We couldn't go back home. We drifted for more than 15 days, waiting for the water and food rations to run out, secretly hoping for Africa to appear on the horizon. But Africa never came into sight, nor did any other landmass. To die, but to die free, that's what we had won. Lala's and her companions' forced crossing lasted for only 17 days because of their successful revolt. But slave ships could take six weeks to two months to cross from the African coast to the other side of the Atlantic, depending on the point of departure, the point of arrival, and weather conditions. Some 20% to 30% of these people, regarded as chattels, died during the journey. The Trans-Saharan death rates during the forced exodus were quite comparable. The slave caravans covered hundreds of miles under a blazing sun with poor food and very little water. The fate of those victims was therefore no more enviable than that of the people who took the Atlantic or Indian Ocean routes. <laughs>
Monsieur Massé is a settler on the island of Bourbon. His plantation produces highly profitable sugarcane and coffee. He's going to tell us his method for ensuring that his 182 slaves worked hard. Whether we were producing coffee, sugarcane, or any other kind of foodstuffs, the fortune of our colonies relied on a simple formula, slave labor. On my plantation, I try to conquer the natural laziness of Negroes by the proper use of sufficiently vigorous methods. That is to justify this exploitation that the concept of racial hierarchy will be used. The supposed inferiority of Africans will be used to give good reason for their enslavement and the use of daily physical and emotional terror to keep them in this state and break their resistance. As soon as they arrived on the island, the slaves were put on display in markets. We knew all the ruses the slave traders used to make us think that sick Negroes were in good health, but we saw through them and felt over the merchandise properly. Notwithstanding the oil covering their bodies, we managed to squeeze their arms and legs to check how vigorous they were. We examined their teeth to estimate their age, and so on and so forth. And after being purchased, the Negro was marked with the plantation brand just like a pig or a cow. We made Christians out of them. They had to forget their far-off savannah, their former life as free women or free men, their culture, their language, and their barbaric customs. Some people said that Negroes couldn't feel pain and that their screams when being flogged were just play-acting. I myself did not believe that, but it did seem to be in the natural order of things that this race, so physically hardy and yet so feeble-minded, should be under our control, like animals. The legal status of slaves, as defined by texts such as the Code Noir, Codigo Negro, and the Barbados Slave Code, for instance, treated them as movable goods, chattels over which the master had full control, able even if he considered the punishment suitable to put them to death. This text was far too liberal, and on our plantations we had to be much firmer. So, I used to insist that when there was a punishment on my plantation, the other slaves had to watch so that although only one of them felt the crack of the whip on his skin, they all felt psychologically the terror of the master and the terrible consequences of his rage. Punishments. 20 lashes. Branding with the fleur de lis. Hamstringing. Being hung by the ribs. Flogging to death. All this made me, in their eyes, the most monstrous and redoubtable of men. And when I sent one to the dungeon, I could almost see the relief in his eyes, wanting almost to thank me for only condemning him to hunger, thirst and total darkness for days on end. And it was because of the terror I inspired in my slaves that my plantation was a model of its kind and my profits among the highest on the island. All this time-consuming work was demolished in the saint Lo uprising in one night when my plantation was razed to the ground by my slaves. Juan was born into slavery in Cuba. His mother was sold. He saw his father, who had made several escape attempts, hanged. He's going to tell us how his long work days were organized. Every morning, except Sunday, the bell rang at six o'clock. A long walk to the field was ahead of us. That was how my day started, like that of most of the slaves on the plantation. You had to bend down, pull the cane stalk up, 
and cut it with two or three heavy slashes of a machete. For the adults, a single strike was enough. Once the cane was cut, it had to be stripped of its leaves, again with a machete. This is what we did all day long. I could feel the sun bite into my skin. It was really tiring work. I understand better why my father had always tried to escape. He told me that the master made us work like animals. That I should never forget that I was a human being, and not a beast of the fields, born for cane, coffee, banana or cotton. Sometimes, the overseer ordered me to go and unload wagons full of cane and fill the crusher. You had to be very strong to make the machines work and get all the juice out of the cane. The men kept coming up to the machine to empty the cane the very last drop. Then we had to start again, over and over, and never leave a drop. Before nightfall, we would leave the fields and be assigned to other chores, often for the master's residence. Sometimes, when it was not harvest time, the master hired me out to Mr. Garcia to go and work in his mines. I met other slaves there. They didn't speak a word of Spanish, but knew a great deal about working in the mines. I went back to my hut at night to quickly gulp down a small ration of sifted corn and a bit of bacon before collapsing onto my straw bedding. Although Juan worked on the plantations like most slaves, others were assigned to domestic tasks in the master's house. Sometimes I went with Callo to the river to help him to wash down the horses. Callow was a driver, the master's driver. He was always well dressed. He told me that when he took the master into town, he sometimes met blacks who had small businesses. Some of them were even artisans. Some of them were free. But that was really unusual because it was rare for masters to allow slaves to buy their freedom. One Sunday evening, the master came across me looking at a book that Callow had brought back for me from town. The master, who was usually kind to me, flew into a rage and grabbed the book out of my hand. Those things are not meant for slaves, he kept saying. Slaves have often been thought of as just cane cutters. In fact, slaves occupied different functions that were useful for the slave society that exploited them. For example, in the construction of buildings, roads, port facilities, ships, or in the military, etc. In the case of the slave trade in the Arab Muslim world, slaves sometimes occupied very important functions. High-ranking army officers, personal advisors to sovereigns, some of them even occupied important command posts. Whether in the transatlantic slave trade or the slave trade in the Arab Muslim world, the men and women reduced to slavery brought with them valuable knowledge and skills, such as the mastery of various techniques in agriculture, construction, river navigation, mining, and ironworking. In this way, they helped to export the skills and technology developed by African societies to the countries that exploited them. Nani comes from the Ashanti Empire. As a child, she was captured, sold, and shipped to the British West Indies. Her only thought since she arrived on the island has been to run away, to the Blue Mountains, synonymous with marooning and with freedom. We had decided some months ago to run away from the plantation. The opportunity arose when an overseer began to whip a pregnant woman. My brother flew at him and felt him with a punch. Other slaves decided to set themselves free and run away with us. <laughs> 
While running away, our group had to split up in order to confuse our pursuers. We knew that the white settlers, their hounds and a platoon of soldiers posted on the island were on our tracks. We found refuge in a vantage point in the mountains, from which we could see our enemies advancing and could thus forestall their attacks. Our community gradually became organized and well-structured. We lived off our crops, animal husbandry, hunting and gathering. We did not, however, forget our enslaved comrades on the plantations. We sometimes gave them poison to get rid of an authoritarian or even sadistic overseer or master. But we raided the planters regularly, burning their crops and fields and stealing their livestock. Freeing the slaves whenever possible and taking them under our wing. And we inflicted so many defeats on the English army that England was obliged to sign a treaty recognizing our freedom and the independence of our lands. Weakened by repeated uprisings, by the abolition campaign and by the great popularity of some of the leaders of the abolition movement, such as William Wilberforce in England, Victor Schelcher in France, Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman in the US, and Joachim Nabucco in Brazil, the slave states were obliged, one after the other, to abolish slavery. Ironically, in the wake of the abolition of slavery, slave owners were compensated by the authorities for the loss of their property. But in any case, the slaves, who had been the only victims of this system, will not receive any compensation. It is these revolts, numerous, repeated, increasingly organized, that will contribute to the progressive abolition of slavery since 1791, from the great slave uprising in Santo Domingo to the abolition of slavery in Brazil in 1888. Free at last, the slaves had triumphed after waging a daily battle for more than 400 years. From African villages, to the holds of the slave ships, and to the plantations, those men and women constantly revolted, protesting against their inhumane plight in life. The story of these men and women is the story of the emergence of multicultural societies that have been shaped by the intermingling of the descendants of Amerindians, Africans, Europeans, and Asians. It is the story of the music that moves us and that we listen to every day. Blues, salsa, samba, mayola, hip-hop, reggaeton. It is the story of Brazilian candomblé, religious syncretism, orishas, the Ganawa spiritual knowledge, forms of body movement between dance and combat like capoeira, the essence of tango. These men, women, and their descendants managed to transcend the unprecedented oppression, to leave humanity as a whole a heritage of immense wealth in the field of the arts, knowledge, and thought, politics, spirituality, and ethics. Tu n'as pas eu ce sentiment Je me souviens quand Rosa Parks se rebella dans le bus à l'heure de la lutte des races, noir et le fruit de l'arbuste. Je me souviens de Martin Luther qui est son rêve, dans lequel les hommes seraient égaux et prêts pour la trêve. Je me souviens de Marcus Garvey, le prophète man, de Malcolm X et de Nation of Islam. Je me souviens de Muhammad Ali et de sa frappe légendaire, un brave avec un fort caractère. Je me souviens quand Jordan s'éleva dans les airs, quand Usain Bolt fendit le vent et la poussière. Je me souviens du roi Pelé, de son jeu ensorcelé, de son talon à pousser. Ballon dans le filet, je me souviens de Teddy, carrure impressionnante, un guerrier olympique qui peut te laisser dans la tourmente. Je me souviens aussi de Miles et de son jazz enflammé, de Jimmy et de sa guitare diablée. Je me souviens de Pippi King et de ses air swing, de Bob Marley, cause Arewana Jamming. Et comme Pai et moi, tel les dos gardenia, sa mélancolie cubaine, tu couches même ton carré d'as. Sur un son de Michael, le roi de la pop, ou de James Bond dans son play dans le hip hop. Je me souviens de Madame Morrison, elle compensée pour sa. La plume, des belles lettres résonnent la tête dans l'enclume Je me souviens de Hux et du Grand Dumas De bons hommes au bon cœur qui avaient de bons karma Je me souviens du Condoblé ou encore du Vaudou Religion doublée d'un rythme transcendantale assez fou Là-bas je 
voix des Gnawa qui survivent dans ce dawa Et les révoltés qui dansent sur un air de capoeira Je me souviens de Basquiat et de ses belles prouesses Le hip-hop en place pour ses maîtres de noblesse Though slaves have triumphed after being long oppressed, they responded to dehumanization and violence with resistance. Physical resistance, countless uprisings, and then Haiti, the first republic to apply the universality of human rights. Daily resistance by a thousand tricks to undermine the slave system. And most of all, cultural resistance through dance and music religion, and language. They have thus shown that inhumanity and barbarism were not the hallmarks of those enslaved through violence, but of their oppressors. The slave trade and slavery are now things of the past, but they have left in their wake a tenacious poison that plagues our societies today, racism. Since 2001, the slave trade and slavery are now acknowledged as crimes against humanity in international law. But does that mean that slavery no longer exists? Has it not taken other less blatant forms, while still turning some human beings into other human beings' chattels? Action to combat new forms of slavery, racism, and racial discrimination has not ended. It is taken every day in major international organizations, such as UNESCO, and even in the schoolyard. One thing is certain, we can all play a role individually and thus help make the world a fairer place. It's enough, let me free. Let me free it. 